Greetings in the name of Jesus. It's good to be at Myerstown, spending uh, last week with the Susquehanna congregation. It is good to be back with you all here at Myerstown. We did have a very good week. I want to say thank you for your prayers. We could feel your prayers. Susquehanna has a special place in our hearts. They're very receptive, very responsive, very attentive uh, congregation. So it was a tremendous blessing. And I say that as an encouragement as we go into a week of meetings, it means so much to uh, an evangelist when there is good attendance and good attention and just uh, uh, a connection. So I am certainly looking forward to our week with Brother Mike Burkholder. This morning, I'd like to bring a message entitled, Overcoming in the Last Days. Overcoming in the Last Days. So I kind of gave you the two themes in the title. Uh, the main theme is going to be overcoming. And then there's a sub-theme, uh, the last days. And I'm not sure what comes to your mind when you think of the word overcoming. Are you an overcomer? I did a, did a uh, search. All the times the word overcome is in the Bible. Overcome or overcometh. There's many ver uh, forms of the word. And I forget how many times I, I came up with it. But it's really, uh, it appears mostly in Revelation. I think there's, I didn't write it down, but uh, there's, it's several times, by far the most in Revelation, I think twice as, as, as any other book. So there's something about overcoming and the end times. Overcoming. Overcoming has the idea of obstacles. And it would really be interesting to open it up for testimonies and ask, what are you overcoming? In other words, what are you facing right now that looks really big? That's a real test. There are people that overcome sicknesses, diseases. There are people that overcome, uh, yeah, a, a whole array of challenges. When I think of overcoming, incredible odds of overcoming, I think of one of the recent books that I read earlier this year. I read a book, it's called, the title of it is Unbroken. And it's a story of a, uh, of uh, Louis Zamberini, he was, it's, he, his, his story, the setting is primarily in World War II, and his plane went down and in the Pacific, and not all of his crew survived. He was in a raft for some, for some like, like 40 days. Uh, what they faced and overcame was incredible. They had so little food. And so they had it all rationed out, and then one night, kind of a phobia came over one of the persons, and he just ate all the food. And they had all, suddenly they had no food. Uh, they shrank to skin and bones, really. They ate wild birds, I think specifically albatross. They would kill them, get them to land on the, on, on the raft. Uh, one, time a, one time a plane appeared, and it was their ray of hope, and this plane came down, and the closer it got, they got their attention, and only to discover it was the enemy, and the Japanese opened fire on them as target practice, and so they quickly got underwater. They knew how far they needed to get underwater so the bullets wouldn't hit them, and only to engage in hungry sharks underwater. So they're fighting off the hungry sharks. So it's one of those books that's hard to put down. And they were finally rescued by the enemy, the Japanese. And they were prisoners of war. And their prisoner of war story, that's the bulk of the book. The prisoner, they're, they're, they were prisoners of war for a long time till the war ended. But they had this man called the bird that was just the epitome of mercilessness. No heart. He would actually uh, just thrive on human suffering. It's, it's beyond me. 
the treatment, the treatment in that prisoner of war camp was almost too gruesome to even talk about publicly. And the, the war finally ended and they went home and then only to start another challenge. Post-war, uh, what do they call that? P PTSD, po post-trauma, uh, I can't, stress disorder, something like that. But it's actually incredible. He'd wake up in the night, he'd be sweating. And all he could think about was this man called the bird. And he, he, the obstacles in his life that he overcame are just unending. It affected his marriage. His wife couldn't handle it anymore. His wife moved out. He turned to alcohol. And the best part of the book is his wife finds Jesus as her personal savior and goes back and coaxes him. And he finally yields to the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal savior. And I guess my takeaway from that whole book it's a lot of gruesome stuff. But my takeaway in that whole book was when he found Jesus, his disorder immediately stopped, miraculously. He never one time again had one of those sweating nights and revenge. All he, all he wanted to do prior to conversion was kill the bird. After his conversion, he had one agenda, and that's forgive the bird and he actually made a trip to, back to Japan in search for the bird, but he found several of the prisoner of war uh, staff that he just, remember me? I forgive you. It was a, there's some parts of the book that are just a little coarse, but unfortunately that's the way war stories are. But I, mentioned the book because the ending is just incredible, how he gave his life to the Lord Jesus and became a, a, a soldier of the cross. He was an overcomer. Are you an overcomer? Why overcome? Or will we be overcome? We will either overcome or will be overcome. That's the, that's the question. And it, it will intensify in the last days. It will. I'm going to read a passage of scripture that I believe is going to show us that. The end is always a pertinent topic. The end times. You're aware that there will be a callousness develop in most people's hearts about the end times. Although many will never articulate it, there will be this subtle callousness well, the, we've been hearing that ever since the fathers fell asleep. That's what Peter says, his words. In other words, ever since my father or grandfather died, they've been talking about that. So there will be a callousness about the last days. There will be scoffers. And I think that's somewhat alarming. Overcoming in the last days. Jesus said, I have overcome the world, be of good cheer, we're told not to over, I'm a, we're told not to uh, allow evil to overcome us, but overcome evil with good. John writes, I write to you young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. You're strong, the word of God abides in you, and you overcome the wicked one. John writes so optimistically, I like that. Revelation says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and you shall be, he, he shall be my son. So I think what I'm going to do is uh, read, read Matthew 24. So the kind of if you want a structure to the message, I'm going to give you three waves and then three weapons. And we're going to get the three waves in Matthew 24. We're going to read of what Jesus said about the last days. And I believe he outlines the three tsunamis or waves that are going to overcome many people. 
Now, I like baseball. <laughs> yeah, I do. I love to play it, and I can, I, I can just stop and watch a baseball game. Sometimes I'm pulling out of, of the carpet shop. There's a little baseball uh, diamond right there. It's little leaguers, I guess. And there's uh, something within me just enjoys. I don't know anybody, but I, I just I like the game. You know, when I would play baseball, you know, one of the worst things happened? You get a comfortable lead in the fifth inning. Maybe you even contribute to that lead. And then guess what? In the last inning, you blow it. I don't even like watching games like that. You know, if you're watching somebody, you're kind of rooting for their team, and, and they got a comfortable lead, and the, and the last inning, you lose it all. And it's a defeat. What a what big deal about your lead in the fourth or the fifth or the sixth or the seventh. That's a lousy illustration, right? Okay? But I really believe, with all my heart, in the last days, there's going to be a lot of casualties. There's going to be what the Bible calls a great falling away. And this is not a doomsday. This is not a, hopefully not even a pessimistic message. It's just reality. And my, my encouragement in sharing the message is I want to clearly identify from Jesus three specific waves in this passage. There's three. That he specifically identifies. And he says, and, and, and what kind of bothers me, every one of the waves, he says, many are going to be overcome. Many. I'm not going to close there. I want to get through this quickly. And then I want to close with three weapons that will help every one of us overcome in the last days if we learn to use them skillfully. So let's read in Matthew 24. Let's see if we can find the three waves. So, verse 1, Jesus went out and departs from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not these things? Verily I say unto you, that there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall be not thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all the things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. These are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and shall, you shall be hated of all nations. All nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many and because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold but he that endures to the end the same shall be saved. I think I'm going to stop reading there. It's kind of hard to just uh, stop and in the middle of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the all of the discourse but one observation. People really want to know what's up in the last days. They really want to know. In fact, I wrote that in my Bible. People really want to know. I mean, disciples, I don't know what it was looked like, but I get the picture as they came out and they said, Jesus, check it out. I mean, check those buildings out. Is that magnificent or what? And I, it's kind of like they wanted Jesus to say, yeah, wow. And Jesus says, not one stone is going to remain on another. Okay. And part of that was, that was fulfilled in 87 day when Titus came in. So some of this, some of this uh, is, is referring to what happened then, but most of it is referring to the very the end times. So people really want to know, uh, second observation is Jesus starts off with, take heed, take heed, just be careful, listen up, take heed, 
uh, don't be deceived. He goes on and talks about all the wars and the fightings and the famines and the pestilences and so on. And in other words, Jesus is going to return. I think, I, 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 am, I am hoping that everybody here agree, agrees with that. Jesus will return. The return of Christ is imminent. Uh, the last days have, uh, it's a reality. And I, I really believe the last days or the return of, slash return of Christ have phases, okay? So I personally believe there's going to be phases of Jesus' return. I believe there's going to be a phase one where Jesus will be in the air and the Bible says we that are remain will be caught up. I think that's a phase, one phase of the return of Christ or one phase of the, of the last of the last days. I also believe... Uh, that there is a phase of Jesus in Revelation 19. It appears like his, he, he's coming on a white horse. And then the saints are with him. So it almost makes sense to me like this whole thing is a, is a, a phase where, number one, they're caught up. Maybe there's a little honeymoon. Could be the, to the tune of about seven years. And while some really horrible things are happening here, and then there's another phase of Jesus coming back with his church, Revelation 19. Zechariah says that his, his feet will touch Mount Olives. So, and again, as we're not here to dissect all that, but I'm saying I, I, really, I really believe that, that the, when it comes to the last days and the return of Christ, it, it can be a really big package. That we don't, nobody really fully understands. In fact, Peter stood up in his sermon that we talked about this morning, and I think in there he said, hey, look, what we're seeing here is part of the last days. So I really believe that we're, we're in the last days, and I really believe that the, the, the point that I'm really trying to emphasize is that in the last days, there's going to be, unfortunately, casualties. And there's only one way that you and me will not be part of the casualties, and that is to be, to be aware and to be alert and to use the weapons and to fight. Fight like, fight like a, a valiant warrior. I'm going to tell you what I think the three waves are that Jesus identifies. They're in verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12. Here they are. It says, many will be offended. That's wave one. Many will be offended. That word offended has, carries the idea of losing heart, stumbling, giving up. Maybe they're simply disappointed with life. Life circumstances. I don't need this. I didn't order this. I can't take it. It's kind of like John when he was in prison. I feel for John. You know the story? John, was in, John the Baptist was in prison, and he, he, he started entertaining thoughts. He said, you know what? I wonder if I was on the right way. So he sent a message back to Jesus, and the message was, Jesus, are you really the way? Or should I look for somebody else? Jesus got a message back to John, and the message was simple. Good things are happening. We're in my ministry, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended. Offended in me. So the first wave is being offended. Did you ever see an offended person? Did you ever get offended? Am I offended? And by the way, when offenses come... When people get offended, the natural thing to do is blame the circumstances on somebody. Tack the blame or responsibility on somebody around me. Who's responsible for this? Well, I, I'm good at that. You are too. And that will always result in a breakdown of relationship. Always. Read on. Offended. Betray. Hate. I see breakdown of relationship. I think the first wave that I need to be very aware of is the wave of being offended. My Bible says many. And then, time frame. And I'm not going to try to pinpoint a time. 
I'm not dead set on certain my view of eschatology. But Jesus says, then. Seems to be after the heat's turned up. All nations are going to hate. Are we aware of that? All nations, catch that. All nations, sometimes we put confidence in a kingdom. And some people think it's very important to be involved in kingdom, earthly kingdoms. Revelation 13 says so clearly that all kingdoms will come against Christ. All kingdoms, all nations. It will, come, it will become one world. Your hope should never be in a nation, ever. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. So the heat's going to get turned up and many are going to get offended. Second wave, many are deceived. Verse 11, many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Deception. I know we talked about that pre uh, previously. We, we, we took a walk through the garden and deception uh, has steps. And we looked at that in Genesis 3. And deceiving, being deceived is simply believing something that's not true. And maybe more specifically, deceive, being deceived is, is finding an alternative to kingdom values, to reality, what's really real, what Jesus said. And I'll be honest, we live in a very deceptive culture, extremely deceptive. A health and wealth gospel pretty much prevails, not totally. The way of suffering, the way of the cross is kind of a foreign message deception. Here is Christ. There is Christ. Oh, there it is. And they'll run here. And they'll be empty. And they'll run there. And they'll be empty. But the, 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 the few that will overcome are resting. They found, the, they found the person, the one they're looking for. And they can, they're, they're at rest. They found Jesus. Deception. Just for curiosity, I, I typed in my concordance, be not deceived. I thought if deceptions, I mean, we could talk a lot about deception, but let's, let's just get four, let's, let's, get, let, let's get a few handles on what, the way people are deceived. Four times in the New Testament, you'll find be not deceived. Look it up for yourself. To, uh, that's a very interesting study. I'll tell you what the four are. Number one, you'll find the parallel scripture to what we just read in Matthew 24 and Luke. Matthew doesn't use the exact words, be not deceived. Luke 21, 8 does. Uh, be not deceived. And it's about many running here and running there and saying, I am Christ and here is Christ and so on. Just this, this whole thing about finding, finding what Christ has to offer somewhere other than Christ. And that, that's, that's one, be not deceived. The second be not deceived is in second, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It says, be not deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom. So that tells me that people will be deceived in thinking that unrighteous people will get in the kingdom. And then there's about six characteristics mentioned. Here they are. Sexual immoral people will not get into the kingdom. Don't be deceived on that. Secondly, idolaters will not get into the kingdom. Don't be deceived. Thirdly, adulterers, homosexuals will not get into the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says it. Be not deceived. Thieves. Thieves. Greedy. Drunks or drunkards. Revilers. Swindlers or extortioners. Wow. So somehow people are going to be de deceived and thinking there will be a way. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, don't be deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. It was in the Sunday school lesson. Save yourself from this untoward generation. In other words, get, separate from the crooked generation. Don't find your intimate communications there. Evil communications will corrupt good manners. If, if you have intimate communications and fellowship with those out, with, with uh, 
evil folks, it's going to corrupt you. And for some reason, I gather from the scripture that people will be deceived in that area. And then the last be not deceived is in, in uh, Galatians 6, 9, where it says, uh, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. So, so somehow people are dis- will be deceived that you can sow something and not reap. I can do a little something here, but it won't, I won't reap the consequences. Y- y- we will. It's a deception. And we could go on and on with that. But uh, the second wave is going to be de- deception. There's a scary verse in 2 Thessalonians where it says, God will send strong delusions. Did you ever read that verse? Did you, did you unlock it or unpack it? I don't. God will send strong delusions to those that love not the truth because they believe a lie. So it's almost like God says, okay, if you want to go that way, I'll even, I'll, I'll even I don't want to say help you out, but God's sending strong delusions to, if that's the, if that's the deception you want and you want to believe that, then I'll, it's, 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 like I said, that's a scary verse, but the deception. The third wave, quickly, is because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And there we have the word many. So the word many is in verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12. And that's why I'm going to call them tsunamis. And it's because of iniquity. I understand iniquity to mean lawlessness or no restraint. And that's going to affect your love. That's going to affect your devotion. That's will, that will affect your discipline. And it's going to be a, this love waxing cold is going to be a slow process. It's going to be a wax. Layer by layer by layer. I don't know if I quite understand the word wax. Waxing cold. But that's the third wave. The iniquity, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And I think it's going to really uh, show up in our desire. The desire is not there for truth. You know, the Bible talks about as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. And I guess let's do a, vi- let's do a vital check. What's, you know, a doctor gets very concerned if you lose your appetite. Let's do the vital check. Let's do a vital check on me. Desire check. Love of many is going to wax cold. And I think that when love waxes cold, the desire, and if you don't really, really love somebody, you have less desire, right, to be with them. You love somebody, you want to be with them. The love of many will wax cold because of iniquity. Well, that was enough on the three waves, but let's identify them. Let's can can we can we just make at least a mental note? Is it possible that one of us? Let's get get serious. Is it possible that one person in this auditorium would be overcome, gone under, under the wave? Perished because of offenses, because of, what was the second one? Deception or iniquity, lawlessness, no restraint. Is, uh, let, let's, just, let's just all together guard. We can make it. We can overcome all tsunamis, all of them. Here's how. Revelation 12. Revelation 12, I'm going to give you three weapons that will help you, help me, help all of us together overcome. And this, by the way, is, uh, was my theme verse at the Susquehanna, although I did, congregation, although I didn't preach on it, every night we recited it. And just, I don't know, I just, did something to me. In verse 12, I'm sorry, verse 11 of Revelation 12, we find this verse. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb 
and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives to the death. So it's pretty obvious, right? There's your three weapons. There we go. I, I, I'll guarantee success in the, in the war, guaranteed. If you have those three weapons, the blood of the lamb, the word of your testimony, and they love not your life unto the death. Let me just tell you a little bit about Revelation 12. It's kind of a drop in and grab the verse, I know, but uh, uh, how long ago is it since we went through the book of Revelation? Revelation, I think, is a little uh, uh, stop in maybe the sequence of events unfolding and give a summary of Israel's history. That's how I see Revelation 12. God has a tremendous plan for the nation of Israel. You see that in the son that's born. You see that in uh, the, the, the man-child, the, the mother, the dragon, and so on. But this chapter, I believe, poses a prophetic view of Israel's uh, history and its future. And it highlights a war. That's, that's the highlighted theme in Revelation 12. Satan always has opposed God's agenda. If it was Israel, Satan opposed it. And when in Israel, there was the promise of the Redeemer, the man-child, and Satan did everything he could to wipe out the man-child, Jesus. And he was not successful. But the point is, Satan will always have an agenda to come against God's program and God's people, whether you're in Israel or whether you're in the new dispensation of the Gentiles or the, the church. God, uh, Satan always has an agenda. And earth is the battleground. And he's always going to uh, fight. Well, not always, as long as he can. You know, you heard the story about the missionary couple that went that had a snake in their house and they went, what do we do? And they went and told a native and the native went in and with a machete, one swing, decapitated the, the, the snake and triumphantly emerged the missionary's house. Got it. But, warning, the native said, don't go in that house until the thrashing stops. That snake does not know it's dead yet. Even though it's heads off. Apparently the snake's uh, neurology and blood flow are that which takes a long time for it to stop moving. And for the next couple of hours, that couple watched that or listened to that snake thrash and wreak havoc in their home, crashing furniture, and until it knew it no longer had a head. And then it was dead. Satan's just like that snake. It's been decapitated at Calvary but it's got some time. Satan's not in hell yet. False prophet is going first. Next, the Antichrist. And next is Satan. That's the order they'll go. Satan's not there yet. He's thrashing. He's defeated. Jesus is the victor. We decide who we want to serve. Let's go to our weapons. Number one, the blood of the Lamb. Some will use the powerful weapon, some won't. Some will resort to another method. Some will rely on their work. Some will rely on movements, methods. But I want to tell you something. It's the blood of Jesus. We sang about it in one of our hymns this morning. I will sing about the blood. Uh, the, apply it. And this is kind of hard for me to just really make application to it. In, in, in the... Passover times, it is simple, right? Take the blood and put it all over your doorpost. And I asked you this morning, is the blood all over your doorpost? Is it? If somebody comes to your house, nothing but the blood. The blood's all over. The blood of Jesus echoes from every part of my life. Or is it a mixture? The blood Maybe it's this simple. First John says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That's a fact. And then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us and cleanses us and cleanses us and cleanses us and cleanses us. Continual, that word is a continual process from all sin. What's the verb or what's the command? Walk in the light. So I walk in the dark, there's no blood. 
Walk in the light. Fellowship's a given, by the way. You walk in the light, fellowship's a given. You walk in the darkness, fellowship doesn't happen. Walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Second, weapon. So let's get that weapon and, 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 and use it. The blood, use it this week. Talk about the blood. Something comes against you. Talk about the blood, the blood of Jesus. Ooh, Satan hates the sound of it because he knows it's not your works or my works. It's the blood that defeated him. So use it. Secondly, word of your testimony. This one's a burden. This burden springs from a discussion I had with a group of people, and it was in reference to sharing personal testimonies. And one person told me, I don't have a personal testimony. I, I have never recovered from that, and I don't ever plan to. I don't have a personal testimony. Now, I understand that it's very hard for some of us to articulate it. Some of us are very, I'll be honest, it's really even hard for me to understand all the points in my own journey. I had a two-year crossroad years, I call them, that it's a little hard for me to say exactly what all was going on. One thing I know, there was a few stakes along the way that are very real to me. And sometimes a stake here is even more real than a stake here. And I'll be honest with you, I enjoy talking about it. And I'm guessing you do too. If you have no stakes along the way, clear-cut stakes, I will and I will not. Maybe, it is, maybe it's even throwing something away in the trash can. That hinders you. That's a stake. It's part of your journey. Everybody's got a beautiful story. And every story must have the cross and the blood. Stories should vary. Stories will vary. Stories, nobody, nobody's story is going to be exactly the same. But you must have a story. You must have a testimony. If you don't have a testimony, either you don't have a testimony or you don't know how to articulate your testimony. And I hope it's the second. I think part of this testimony thing is also talking to the devil. Curious. Anybody talk to the devil here? I didn't see any courageous hands. I probably would have done the same thing. I do, but not enough. And you should. We need, in fact, I, 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 it's hard to go in and grab a verse, and that's exactly what I did. The context. You know what the context is? The context is, the, go back to verse 10, the accuser of the brethren is cast down. I want to tell you something. Some of the reason we don't, aren't vibrant about our testimony is because of the accuser. You have an enemy that wants to make you feel as bad as he possibly can. And he'll throw everything you did wrong in your face and make you feel like a complete failure. He's going to be cast down. But apparently he has, I mean, he appeared to God in light of Job and was telling Job some things, I mean, telling God some things about Job. He's an accuser. And I think he accuses you to God. And he says 100% truth. He would never go to God and say, so-and-so did so-and-so. He wouldn't lie to God. He tells the truth. So picture the scenario. Satan goes to God. He did this. Yeah, he did, but did God said, did, do you see this? And somebody said this. To, uh, I like it. When the devil brings up your past, or when the devil reminds you of your past, just remind him of his future. I think it is right 
to do just like Jesus did and talk to the devil. When, you, when you're in the heat of the moment in a temptation, it is written. I don't know if there's a more powerful uh, word of testimony than that. It is written, and that's another part of your testimony. Uh, we, we have a word of testimony that is so powerful, but, and Satan's objective is to make you shut up and not share it. And you ha- yours, that guy's story is right on point. Yours is not, and don't even try it. Oh, how many of us are there? He's a, that's a lie. That is a lie. And if you don't, let me say it like this. If you're unclear about your testimony, there's nothing wrong with driving stakes today. Drive the stakes. I will. And get a friend together and make some stakes and go in your Bible. And I have to do this. In my Bible somewhere, I have sta- visible, there they are, stakes, dated, what I said. And... Maybe it's because I'm forgetful, but stakes for your testimony. Lastly, here's, the, here's your third weapon. So we got the blood, we have uh, our testimony, and thirdly, love not their life unto the death. And that's a, that's a huge one, but let me ask it real simply. Are you afraid to die? I'll probably quote, dear brother Harlan Sell about 10 times and here we go again he says I'm not afraid but I'm sure not in a hurry but seriously are you, are you afraid w- would you be okay to die right now if, if, if some of us would be diagnosed with a terminal illness would, would we could we find the grace to surrender and say, it's okay? When, when the church is not afraid to die, I think this, the devil is, he loses one of his greatest tactics of fear. He wants everyone to be af- just afraid. And that, that's part of the pandemic problem, whether people want to admit it or not. A fear. So the death casualty. And I'm not saying we should always want to die. But they loved not their lives to the death. They weren't afraid to die. They would rather die than give up their their testimony for Christ. One of my favorite stories is Dirk Willems. You know the story? Page 741 in your martyr's mirror. So make a note. Go home and get your martyr's mirror. Page 741. You're going to read it. It is so good. You know the story? Dirk Willems. He was running away from his captors. And he came to a little icy lake. Uh, I don't know if it was a lake. It was just a, a body of water, a small body of water. Little, a thin layer of ice. And he gets across safely. He looks back. His captor, the person chasing him, breaks through and is perishing. And there's a picture that many of us seen where he's reaching like this. Dirk Willems turns around and, and frees and, and rescues the person after his life. In so doing, Dirk Willems was put to death and he could have got free. That's a very short version of the story on page 741 of the, of, of the Martyr's Mirror. But how is, that with, how is it with you? How is it with me? Am I afraid to die? Is it... Or are the things of this world so dear? Maybe some of us are like Lot's wife. We're all but, all but out. Safety. And then we remember our stuff. And I think there will be a lot of casualties like that. If you read on through Matthew 24, flee, run, don't look back. So my prayer is that we'll all be overcomers in the last days. Review, three waves. Many offended, many deceived, many love waxing cold. Three weapons. The blood. I'm hoping I, I could just see this army this week. The blood. What about the blood? It's the blood. I'd love it. God would love it more. Secondly, can we see this army right here going out? My testimony. Here's what God did. Here's where I am. Here's what the Bible says. Whoa. And even talking to the devil. 
You want to remind me of my past? You're, look at that date right there. That's where I was on my knees before God. And everybody involved with that thing is taken care of. There's no question marks anywhere. How about that, devil? And by the way, what about your future? I can see this army already. Thirdly, is it possible that every one of us, I'm okay to die. If that's my lot in life, I'm okay. And the enemy does not have a chance. That's the tune of overcomers. Will you be one? Will I be one? With God's help, we all can be one. Let's stand for a closing prayer. Father, here we are. We're your army. We're your soldiers. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. You ordained them. We're going to use them. And Lord, I pray that you will ordain opportunities for us to sing about the blood, talk about the blood, apply the blood, have the blood all over our doorposts. I pray that you'll give us opportunities this week to share our testimonies. And even, Lord, I pray that you'll give us that resolve to say, it's you, no matter what, even if it's our life. And Father, there isn't one wave that would be able to overcome us. Thank you for the overcoming power that we find in Christ. And would you grant it to each one of us, make us a blessing to all in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. And if we could have a song as we dismiss.